Hi, I'm Richard Moraes, Senior Minister at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center, and I want to thank you for visiting our website and for tuning in to today's message. If you feel inspired by today's talk, I really encourage you to make a donation by hitting that button below and making a contribution to this ministry. It'll allow us to continue these messages online and to do the great work we do here at Unity of Phoenix, which is to inspire people to live better lives. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for your support, and we hope to see you at a Sunday real soon. How are you doing today? I want to take you on an adventure. You want to go? Okay, I've got uh, a, a string of helicopters coming. But for this adventure to work properly, you have to put on your imagination cap. Okay? You know what an imagination cap is? It's when you, what you put on when you really want to use your imagination. It started by the idea of a thinking cap. How many of you ever heard of putting on your thinking cap? Thinking cap goes all the way back to the 1600s. Did you know that? It went, first in the literature was 1605 when the character put on his contemplation cap. And when he put on his contemplation cap, he had three thoughts. So it was a three-sided cap. It says, I'm right, you're right, or maybe. <laughs> right? So your, your, your imagination cap is what truly allows you to go on adventures. So we're gonna go on an adventure today. And so you're gonna put on your imagination cap. Let's all do it, let's put on our imagination caps. Buckle them in, because I don't want any brain falling out or anything, right? <laughs> Buckle them in. Now we're gonna go on an adventure. And before the adventure starts, I'm gonna give you a backpack. And in your backpack is a little water, a couple bottles of water, a couple of granola bars, definitely an apple, a compass, some matches, comfortable uh, hiking boots designed just for you, uh, and a blindfold. What's not allowed in your backpack is any phones. So you have to leave your phones here. And what's going to happen after service is that I, I've got all these helicopters coming, and they're going to take each and every one of us in a helicopter, and they're going to take you 100 miles away from everything. So even if you sneak your phone into the, under the helicopter, you're going to be so far away from any cell service, it's not going to work anyway. And I'm going to take you 100 miles away from everything, and it's your job to find your way home. Right? How many of you ever watched one of these survival shows? We're going to do Unity Survival. Right? So you're going to get in a helicopter. I'm going to take you 100 miles away from anything that you've ever known. And I'm going to dump you in the wilderness. And you're going to find your way home. How many of you want to play? Last, at last service, we had two people. <laughs> we are an adventurous lot here at Unity. We are an adventurous lot. So we had two of us going last service. We got a few more for this service. So you're going to get in your helicopter. I'm going to hand you a backpack. You're going to go, right? Now, I'm going to blindfold you because I don't want you to see anything, right? So you're going to be blindfolded 100 miles away into the wilderness. You're away from everything. And then we're going to drop you off. Now, there's really about three ways people process this. The first group of people, when I let you out of the helicopter, are convinced they're going to die. <laughs> they're just going to die. They just know they're going to die. There's no point. I'm 100 miles away. There's no way I can find my way. I got two lousy bottles of water, a couple of granola bars, and an apple. I'm going to die, right? So the first group of people, and you know, we'll, we'll kind of raise hands later. The first group of people just knows they're going to die. Second group of people, they get comfortable. They assume that somebody's going to find them, right? So they might build a little bonfire. They might find a little place of shade. They get comfortable because their mindset is, I don't know where I am, so I might as well get comfortable. And, and we see those people in all aspects of life. When they're going through a problem or a situation or a tragedy in their life, they make it a party. They just get comfortable. They know it's going to pass. They make it easy. So the first group, the, the, their first response to life is, oh, I'm going to die. Second group, let's just get comfortable. Now, the third group is interesting because the third group, 
they immediately, when we put them on the ground in the wilderness, they rip off their blindfold. They want to know which direction the helicopter is going back. They grab on their boots. Some of them don't even wait to put on their boots. They got their backpack on, and they are hightailing it for home. They got 100 miles, and their thought process is, I'll be there before lunch. Right? They're the go-getters, the getter duns. They're the ones that get after it and make it happen. Now, I've come to realize that there's a fourth group that I never really thought about until it was presented to me. But there is a fourth group. And they're the group that when the helicopter takes off, when I say good luck, they stand there for about three days with their blindfold on <laughs> because nobody told them to take their blindfold off. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> Now, I love this group because for three days they're standing there mad that nobody told them to take their blindfold off because this group needs clear instructions, right? They don't buy anything from Ikea. They, they need clear instructions, right? So, so there's three, maybe three and a half, maybe four groups, right? Because what I want you to see is that the way you do this is the way you do the problems in your life. Now, in unity, we don't often say problems, but how many of you know you have problems? If you don't, ask your neighbor, do I have problems? <laughs> right? Your neighbor will help you, right? So in unity, we sometimes say, well, I don't have problems, I have challenges. And if challenges are too much, I don't have challenges, I have opportunities. I, or, or we say sometimes, I say, I have blessings yet uncovered, <laughs> right? But the reality is we have problems. And, and as a world, we have problems. Can you agree that we have some problems in the world today? Right? And I want us to be so conscious about how we solve our problems because how we solve our problems, it actually matters. How we move from where we are today to overcome those problems to a better day actually matters. And I want us to be thoughtful about how we problem solve because there's actually a way that we do that that we have problems, but we can overcome these problems. Did you know that there's actually the father of modern, prob modern problem solving? His name is George Paglia. And George Paglia came up with a four-step problem solving methodology. And when you hear it, you're gonna think, well, how simple is that? He actually devised this four-step problem-solving methodology. Step one, understand the problem. Now, how many, <laughs> see some of the difficulty is that before we can even understand the problem, sometimes we actually have to accept that we have a problem. Can I get an amen? amen. See, one of the things that's going on in this country right now is that we don't agree about what the problems are. Right? And if you don't agree what the problems are, you can't solve them. Like, in a, as a country, we think the problems are all over the place. Now politicians, what they're trying to do is define what you believe the problem is. We have some people that think the problem is this, and we have some people that think the problem is that. But we don't have an understanding. Because if we all believe that we have the same problem, how quickly could we fix any problem in this country? But because we're divided on what we see the problems are, we never solve them because we're not moving from the same page. We're, we're at odds with each other over the basic problems that we're facing. So as a country, I think we need to do much better at solving problems. And if it's, if it's an issue in our country, what I also believe, that it's an issue in our life and in our world. How good are you at solving problems? I don't have problems. Okay, well, God bless you. Right? Because, I mean, what do you say to somebody who doesn't think there's anything wrong? Right? So the first one is that you have to understand the problem. And the more you understand the problem, sometimes the problem is actually a couple levels down. You think the problem is this, but it's actually a few steps lower. That you think the problem is your finances. Right? But maybe the problem is really your job. Or maybe the problem really is the way you feel about yourself, what you believe that you're worth. So not only do we have to understand the problem, but we have to understand the problem sometimes underneath the problem. 
that what's the problem that's creating this problem? Let's solve that problem, not just the superficial problem. So the second one is that we have to devise a plan. How many of you have ever used a plan more than once that you know didn't work? How many of you, <laughs> right? How many of you have a family plan that for generation hasn't worked and you're still playing it like it's going to work this time? <laughs> right? So, so we have to understand the problem. Then we have to devise a plan that will solve or fix the problem. Does that make sense to everybody? Is there somebody who doesn't understand that so far? Because if you don't have it this far, we're going to have to stop and back up a bit. So we, there's a problem, we understand the problem, we create a plan to fix the problem, and then we actually have to carry out the plan. We have to implement the, the, the solution. And C, then the fourth one is that you actually analyze the solution to see if it actually fixed anything. Did it make it better? Did it make it worse? Right? How many of you know the story of the uh, rainbow eucalyptus in, in Hawaii? Anybody know the story about the rainbow eucalyptus in Hawaii? Over 100 years ago, the sugar farmers, they brought in from Australia rainbow eucalyptus. And what they wanted to do was create windbreaks because it can get windy on, on many of the Hawaiian islands. So they wanted to create windbreaks for the, the sugar to protect the sugar cane. So they brought in these big uh, rainbow eucalyptus from Australia. The only problem with rainbow eucalyptus is that when you bring something into an island that's non, it's non-indigenous, it sometimes creates more problems than it. And the moment they planted these rainbow eucalyptus, none of the birds would actually land in the rainbow eucalyptus because they didn't get them. They didn't understand them, they didn't want them, they didn't. And the rainbow eucalyptus drinks so much water that it m immediately moved the Hawaiian Islands into a drought. Right? So, and the problem is that once you have them, these little guys are sneaky. Man, it's hard to get rid of these things. They, they, they become, they take over everything. So these rainbow eucalyptus became a problem, right? So was the intent to protect the sugar cane an appropriate problem to solve? I would say yes, right? If you want to believe in sugar cane, yes, right? But the, the way they solve it actually work. Short term, it did protect the sugar cane. Long term, did it create more problems than it solved? Yes, right? So we have to understand the problem, we devise a plan, we carry out the plan, and then we, then we analyze the plan afterwards to see if it actually worked and created the results that we wanted. So over and over again in your life, there's gonna be an opportunity where you have a problem. The more you understand the problem, the more you can devise a plan that works. You try the plan that works, you see if it works, if it doesn't work, you revise and you try again. Are you with me? So Albert Einstein said this, we cannot solve our problems with the, th the same thinking that created them, okay? So would you be willing with me today to talk about problem solving? Because I believe that there are really three perspectives that we need to have when we're problem solving. And the first one is a historical perspective. And the historical perspective, perspective says something like this. I, or we, have solved problems in the past, and I want to know the best way they've solved problems in the past so that I can apply that wisdom, that understanding, that intelligence to the problems that I'm dealing with now. And it doesn't matter what the problem is. It could be a health problem, a money problem, a spiritual problem, family problem, a relationship problem. But the question is, how have they solved this problem in the past? Do you realize that whatever problem you're facing in your life today, it's, you're probably not the first person that has dealt with that situation. Does that seem true? That, that if you're going through a relationship problem or a health problem or a money problem, whatever it is, probably somebody bef gone, has gone before you over the seven billion people on this planet that maybe has had that issue. And the historical perspective says that we actually look back, that we're actually curious enough to wonder enough about how people in the past have solved problems. 
And if we don't understand how people in the past have solved problems, what, what Winston Churchill said, those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. It was actually a misquote from George Stanzia from 1905 when he said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to, compete, to repeat it. So there is a need for a historical understanding of how we got to where we are so that we don't have to stay there. True. Great. Then, once we understand the historical perspective, the next level of problem solving is understanding what the current best thinking is about a problem, right? Because there's actually current level, there's genius, there's wisdom, there's a, there's a huge amount of information now how to solve any problem in our world today. So there's a historical perspective and there's a current level of genius working on most every issue in our world today. And I want you to be familiar, I want you comfortable with knowing both the, the, the history, your past, our collective past about whatever's going on in your life, and I want you to know the current level of genius that's working on any problem. So some of you know that when, when I stepped down from here, when I left here, I served in ministry for four years in Naples, Florida. Now, when I left Unity of Phoenix, it was one of the most successful, it is still today, one of the most successful ministries in the Unity movement. That people would come here to learn how we did ministry. They, they would come and learn how we did it, right? So when I went to Naples, I was kind of full of myself, right? I thought I knew how to do it. I thought, well, I'll go to Naples, I'll create Unity of Phoenix, Florida, and it'll be the bomb. Well, for about six months to a year, I was surprised that it didn't work. Why? Why didn't it work, right? Because I was doing something from the past, bringing it in, into the present moment, thinking that of course if it worked once, it'll work again, and it didn't work at all. It didn't work at all. It didn't even come close to working at all. It didn't work, because why? Because it was a different congregation with different wants and needs and desires. It was a different situation, totally. So I tried to recreate what I knew worked, and it didn't, right? So that leads us to three. So we have a historical, we have a current best thinking, and then we have intuition. Now, what's the role of intuition? Intuition is that thing that guides us internally by God to move to the next highest level of good. That absolutely, that God knows how to get you from point A to point B all the time. God in you is your source of an, an immense amount of wisdom, but we have to access it. Now, why don't we access inner wisdom? Anybody want to throw, go on, throw out an answer? Anybody, why don't we access inner wisdom? We don't trust it, right? Anybody else? We're not meditating, okay, anybody else? Ego, anybody else? Fear, how many of you, it's easier for you to trust an expert than it is to trust yourself? Right, if Dr. Phil says it, it we know it's right. Right? Or if Oprah or Deepak or Wayne, if they say it, we know it's right, but I don't know if I can really trust the Spirit of God within me because I'm not sure if it's guidance or it was, if it was that burrito, right? <laughs> and so I'm not always sure, right? Because I want to be divinely guided, right? That, but I'm not always sure. So one of the things we have to get to to actually know if we're divinely guided is that we have to trust the voice of God within us, true? We have to actually believe that God speaks to each and every one of us. And we actually have to know how to discern the wisdom that's within us. How many of you know that you have five physical senses? Right? Everybody knows that, right? Well, you also have inner senses. You have the, the inner sense of knowing. And people, when this is their level of knowing, they just know the truth. They know what they know. They know, they know it. Some of us are feelers. We feel into a situation, and in the feeling into it, we know which way to go. Some of us actually see things. We have visions. Some of us are visionary. And some of us hear. The voice of God actually whispers in our ear. Okay, so here's what I want. 
You ready for your homework? I want you to pick one issue, one problem, one challenge, one opportunity in your life, and I want you to go through this process. Okay? I want you to actually get a piece of paper and write down what the problem is. It could be a relationship, it could be your marriage, it could be your finances, it could be anything. I want you to write down what that problem is. Now I want you to do a little bit of research. And I don't care if you do it all on Google, right? Google is the, our second brain, right? I want you to give yourself a historical perspective. What have people historically said about that issue or this problem? And I actually want you to write it down. I want you to do a little research project. What have people throughout time said about that? And I want you to write it down. Now, I want you to go and find the greatest minds in the world today, current thinking. What is the best current thinking about that problem? And I want you to understand it. And then, once you have those two, once you have a historical perspective and the best current thinking about whatever the situation is, I want you to take that within and actually pray about it. I want you to listen to the voice of God within you. Because we are at a time in our world today where we have to be better at solving problems. Arguing is not solving problems, true? So we have to solve problems. Problems are a problem, right? So we need to understand the historical perspective. We need to understand the current best thinking about whatever the challenge is. But then we need to take it into prayer and we need to allow the Spirit of God to speak to each and every one of us about what the highest and the best is for us. Some of you, I shared on Wednesday that my mom was, um, she had a fall. Took her to the emergency room last uh, Friday. They misdiagnosed it. Um, we took her to her doctor as a follow-up on Monday. He said, I want you to go immediately to the emergency room because I'm, I'm concerned she has internal bleeding. We got her to the emergency room. They, they did a scan. Yes, she's internally bleeding. It was a problem. And she's 84, 83, almost next month, 84. She's got stuff. She's got issues, right? And once they did the scan, they said, we, we need to move her to Scottsdale South because that's, that's the best trauma center in the city. And she's in trauma. And um, so it's about 1 o'clock in the morning by the time we get her there. And um, the trauma surgeon walks in. And this guy is just, boom, this guy's a light. This guy is presence. He is... He is fun. I want to hang out with this guy. This guy walks in, and he's genius par none. I mean, he is, he is fabulous. So he reads mom's condition, and mom's got so many things going on, and this thing competes with this thing, and this thing fights with this thing, and, and it's a problem. It's a challenge. It's a problem. So he looks at all of her stuff, and he starts pacing. I mean, he walks into the room, he walks out of the room. And I, you know, some people are like, will you just sit down and talk to me? And I'm thinking, no, man, I want you, if you're a pacer, I want you to pace, right? If you need to think and walk, I want you to think and walk. And he's thinking about it. He knows that he can only do so much because there's a part of him, he's a surgeon. What do surgeons like to do? Cut. They do. Surgeons like to cut. So there's a part of him that wants to go in and look at it, actually cut it open, see it, and see if he needs to close it up. But the numbers don't really justify that. So he's pacing. Man, he's pacing, right? Now, does he have an historical understanding of people that have internal bleeding? Does he understand that historically? Has he been taught at the best universities? Has he gone to the best seminars? He has a historical understanding. Does he, always, does he also have access to all the genius that is available what he should do in this condition? I want you to see he has both. He has absolutely both of those. But what he's using is his intuition. He's pacing. He's pacing. Finally, he says, okay, we are going to give her a pint of blood. We're going to do this, this, and this. The, all the nurses, like, boom. They're, they're on it. They're, they're going. They're moving a mile an hour. And he's still pacing. Within an hour, she was, like, ready. We didn't know if she was going to make it through the night. Within an hour, her numbers went from here to here. Right? And, and was I so grateful 
for his historical understanding of my mother's condition? Yes. Was I so grateful for that level of genius in him that knew that condition inside and out? Yes. But the thing that made the biggest difference is that he listened to himself, he trusted himself, and he called the shots. And within an hour, she was better. So here's your homework. I want you to take a problem, any problem. I want you to do the, your historical homework on that problem. I want you to, to analyze it. I want you to look at it. I want you to see what have, what have people in the past done with that problem. I want you to then, I want you to go and I want you to look at what current day genius are saying about that problem. Because there are current day geniuses in every area, in every walk of life. But then I want you to take it into yourself. I want you to give it to God. And I want you to listen to what God's saying to you to do about that situation. Because it's not enough just to hear from everybody else. You've got to take it all the way to the top. And you've got to listen to what God wants to do in that situation. Are you willing? Yeah. Let's pray. I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul to the activity of God that is right here, right now. That there is only one, one presence, one power, one God manifesting through each and every one of us. And whatever the challenge, whatever the problem, whatever the need, God is right here, right now. So in all things we listen, we know, and we are set free. And so it is. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. Thanks for being here today.